Good evening, everybody. It's good to be with you tonight for tonight's evening devotion. Tonight, we're going to be continuing on this discussion that we've been having through First Peter. And, uh, and Peter is continuing on some of his thoughts. So we've been seeing this a lot. He's been building on a lot of the things that he's been saying. He's repeating a lot of the things that he's saying as he's writing to Christians who are uh, learning about their faith, living their faith, trying to figure out what to do uh, with their faith in the midst of a pagan world and culture, how to, uh, how to discern what God's will is in the midst of, uh, of, of the world that has different ideas and, and, uh, and different things that they're focusing on. So he's saying, okay, this is what the Christian life is going to be like. You're, you're new people. You're called to be holy. Um, you're given a hope in Jesus. And it's not always going to be easy. There's things that you can do that are going to proclaim your faith to others and they're going to see it and they're going to see your living hope and it's going to be an active hope if you do it this way. And uh, if, you're, if you're patient and kind and loving, especially that love idea is one that, uh, that P Peter brings out a lot in this letter. And so when he introduces uh, verse 12 in, in this uh, section tonight, he calls uh, these Christians that he's writing to beloved. He says, beloved. That's how he introduces. He's called them beloved once before in this letter. And, uh, and in a sense, it's, uh, he's, he's about to tell them something that's kind of hard to hear. Uh, and that idea of addressing them as beloved, like in the, in the King James Version, I think it's dearly beloved for this part. You can think of like a wedding, right? Everybody gathered together and the first words are uh, were, used to be dearly beloved, we are gathered here. It's the group of everybody gathered together in this faith. How is it going to be like for us who are sharing these mutual joys and mutual hardships together? That's what he gets to, into in chapter 12 here. And, uh, and so he says, Beloved, don't be surprised when at the fiery trial, when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. So don't be surprised, those of you who share in this mutual love together, because it's going to be hard. It's not always going to be easy to live out your faith. And he's... Um, reiterating then again what the Christian faith looks like. It's a, it's a life of suffering, of uh, fiery trials. He talks about it here. He said this before. So in chapter 1, verses 6 and 7, he says, In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in the praise and honor and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So he said that in chapter 1. Also in chapter 2, verses 20 and 21, he says, let me get to the right page here, for what credit is it when you sin and are beaten for it, if you, you endure, but when you do good and suffer for it, you endure. This is a gracious thing in the sight of God. And then he's, he's talking about... Um, you know, when, when you suffer for something that is your own, it's uh, that, you know, we don't question that. But if it is suffering for the sake of Jesus, then somehow that can be tougher for us and harder for us to understand. And so he's saying, don't be surprised because this is going to happen. And you're going to be tried with fire. He uses this fire imagery in chapter 1. And this happens throughout the Psalms. Um, the, it's repeated, this idea that we're being refined by fire. We're, we've been tried. Um, all the impurities are burned away. So then, then what's left? What's left when everything else burns away in our testing? If you lose everything, what remains? And Peter's saying, if... If all of the things that are um, your sinful flesh and life, and if they've been placed on Christ, then what's going to remain? Well, Christ is going to remain in you, and you're going to be showing his life and, and uh, showing who you are in Jesus when you're willing to suffer for your faith, when you're willing to even die for your faith. Uh, this is what is left when all those impurities are gone, and so we see the power of his work. So then he continues on and he says, rejoice. Instead of being surprised, 
actually rejoice. Rejoice in so far that you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. Uh, James writes about this, and it's the second verse in James's letter. Uh, let me get it right. He says, uh, count it joy when you meet trials of all, t all kinds. And so, man, that's kind of hard to rejoice in the suffering that we see. This is how the um, apostles worked in Acts. Uh, when they were persecuted, they went away rejoicing, worthy, counted being, they were rejoicing that they were worthy of being ones who could suffer for the name of Jesus. And so um, often when, uh, when I face hardships and difficulty, and that's not a time where I'm like, yes, this is the best, man, what a, what a praise God for that. Wow, I know that, uh, that God's at work because everything was awful and it was so hard. No, but it's not just about hard things in life either. Um, it's really when your faith is tested or things in life are different for you than they are for others, uh, when you have to say no to certain things because they're not things of God, they're things of the world, uh, when you are excluded in some way, when you are oppressed in some way, we know this happens around the world in so many ways, um, yeah, there are times when we as Christians are, are persecuted for our faith in the United States. But man, other places around the world, uh, are, other Christians are facing this severely to the point of death in so many ways. Um, and uh, I've seen the statistic that more Christians died for their faith in the 20th century that died in the, for their faith in the previous 19 centuries combined. Christian persecution is... Uh, is still rampant and even um, even worse than it ever has been. And so we earnestly pray for those Christians around us, and we aren't surprised when we see them suffering for their faith, and they're encouraged when they know that there are other Christians um, suffering alongside them and praying for them, and we are encouraged when we see their faith standing up in the face of trial. Now, it continues on. Um, in verse 14, if you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. And so it's all about being in Christ. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or as a meddler. And he's not saying if it's your own fault, well, you're going to suffer. This, this is a different type of suffering. Suffering for the name of Christ, that's, that's one thing. Suffering for your own sin, for your own actions, that's not suffering in the name of Jesus. It's like your own sin, and, and that usually brings worldly consequences. But if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed. Know that this is going to come to you, but let him glorify God in that name. Man, again, this is a difficult word to hear, um, to suffer in this, in this name, but uh, it... There can be bitterness and frustration when, uh, when life is hard as a Christian. But Peter's reminding us to face it with joy and to say, I, it's not about me. It's about what I have been changed into because of the gospel. And my life then reflects the things of God. And, uh, and when that isn't what someone else wants to see, well, I may suffer some persecution for that. But... It's all because of Jesus, and he's being glorified in that moment. And so, uh, he continues on and finishes here. It's time for judgment to begin at the household of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome of those who do not obey the gospel of God? He's quoting Jeremiah there. And then a uh, proverb here. If the righteous is scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? And so he's saying, I mean, we're all sinful. We all sin and fall short of the glory of God. We all have consequences for our own sin, and they need to be wiped away and removed. And it's difficult for us when that happens, and we are found wanting, and yet we have hope that we cling to in Jesus. It's so much worse for those who are outside of Christ. And so we see the effects of our sin, and that could be hard today. It, it, he's kind of giving them a, a strange encouragement here because he's saying, ah, it's hard for you, but 
think about the difficulty of those who are outside of the church. They suffer, and then they're going to continue to be separated from Jesus. There's no comfort there in that type of suffering. We, though we suffer because of our commitment to Christ, our, our proclamation of him, and even in our own sin, we get to run back to Jesus in repentance and receive that life that comes out from his word continually to us. And therefore, Peter says, therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. So we place our hands, or place ourselves, back in the hands of Jesus. And when we suffer, uh, it isn't um, something that we expect or want. But, man, can we be like those apostles who counted it a joy when they were worthy to suffer for the name of Jesus and were able to continue to proclaim that name to others. And, uh, and in that way, they knew that they were bringing glory to the name of God. When we suffer, sometimes it's uh, for our good and benefit because it takes away the things that could hinder our relationship with God and then they uh, bring us back into a clearer unity of what is really important and who really matters. And it's an opportunity for us to see God's work for us and then sometimes it's even an opportunity for us to give up of some of the things that we can't do and allow our neighbor to serve us too. What a joy that that is for them. God's working through our trials to bless someone else. And that's hard for us to see too. But we know that that is the joy in which God is working faith into the hearts of others and faithfulness for his whole body in Christ. One way that we get to proclaim that is in song. And uh, I've been looking forward to singing this hymn tonight because it, uh, it really does express this idea and identity, identity in suffering for faith, but, uh, but knowing that Jesus is the one who is carrying us along and he is glorified in the midst of all this suffering. And so tonight we're going to sing number 756, Why Should Cross and Trial Grieve Me? And it's a Paul Gerhardt hymn and uh, Stephen Starkey also wrote a couple stanzas. We're going to sing all of them tonight because they're all really good, and they point to exactly what Peter is writing about here, this life in Christ. Why should cross and trial grieve me? Christ is near with his cheer, never will he leave me. Who can rob me of the heaven? Let God's Son for me one, when his life was given. When life's troubles rise to meet me, though their weight may be great, they will not defeat me. God, my loving Savior, sends them. He who knows all my woes knows how best to end them. God gives me my days of gladness, and I will trust him still when he sends me sadness. God is good, his love attends me. Day by day, come what may, guides, and, guides me and defends me. From God's joy can nothing sever, for I am his dear lamb, he my shepherd ever. I am his because he gave me his own blood for my good by his death to save me. Now in Christ death cannot slay me, though it might day and night trouble and dismay me. Christ has made my death a portal from the strife of this life to his joy immortal. Let's pray. 
Heavenly Father, give us hearts that rejoice in the sufferings that we suffer for your name. And we pray earnestly for those who suffer for your name around the world. God, comfort them with your gospel and grace. Fill them with the hope of their Savior and the eternal life that he promises. Give them the ability to stand in the face of persecution and even death to proclaim Jesus. And through their witness, Lord, change hearts and lives. And God, we ask that our witness, day by day, would create through us a witness that proclaims your name, shows others how gracious you are, shows others your love through us, that they would also follow you into eternal life. Lord, we pray all this as you bless us tonight in the name of Jesus. Amen. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia.